Hello friends, James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, and as you probably know by now if you've been watching The Corbett Report, I was an English literature student back in my university days, but as you might not know, because I don't have so much reason to bring it up on the podcast, I actually started out as a physics student. For the first semester of my university career, I was intending to go into physics, and I made that old jump from physics to English and never looked back, but I do carry within me some affinity for the uh, the hard sciences like physics, not those soft sciences like oh, the lower order sciences, biology, or uh, social sciences. But uh, so I've always had that inclination and that interest. And so it was that I found myself as an English literature student in one of my sophomore, I guess we would say second year in Canada, uh, English literature classes on uh, literary theory. And we were talking, I can't remember the context in which it came up, but the, the professor said something about how science is politically determined and I thought that was outrageous. I was, uh, as a former physics student, or at least someone who was interested in the hard sciences, I was always on guard against the kind of ridiculous and very unscientific uh, metaphors that are employed by people in the humanities and the social sciences to talk about quantum physics and things like this, where they clearly don't know what they're talking about and they're just make, using buzzwords. And so I was always on guard for that sort of thing. And then to hear someone say that physics and, and other hard sciences could be politically determined was just outrageous. So I actually did go to the length of going to that professor's uh, office during his office hours and trying to ask him, well, what are you saying here? And I remember saying specifically, if I took this you know, tape dispenser or whatever off your desk and I dropped it to the floor, it would fall at 9.81 meters per second squared, regardless of, you know, who's in political power. And he explained it quite simply. He said, well, um, look at Galileo. <laughs> and I thought about that for a moment. I'm like, oh, right. Okay. So it's not, yeah, okay. It's not that science is being politically determined, but that people can, the po political powers can make scientists conform to their statements or beliefs or wishes. Okay, well, hmm, and that got me thinking. Now, in my defense, I, this, I was still green and fresh, and uh, I hadn't even cracked a uh, textbook on the philosophy of science, let alone actually taken a course in it by that point. So, these ideas were new to me at that time. And also, further in my defense, as naive as it sounds in our current day and age, you have to remember that a couple of decades ago, the politicization of science was not as utterly blatant as it is today. Science must shape policy. Science is universal. Science brings out the best in us. With an informed, optimistic view of the future, together, we can, dare I say it, save the world! Thank you! So, you guys, seriously, this next thing I feel is very special. This is a cool little segment. Uh, you know this woman from Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Please give it up for Rachel Bloom. Yeah. This one goes out to all my bipeds who identify as Katie. This world of ours is full of choice. But must I choose between only John or Joyce? All my options only. Heart or moist, my vagina has its own voice. As I say, it's getting really ridiculous, and the idea that politicization of science, what's that? That anyone could have that view and in this day and age is ridiculous on its face. And it just keeps getting more ridiculous by the day. People might have seen just in the past week, uh, skeptic.com publishing an article about another hoaxing of a peer-reviewed scientific, social scientific journal in which uh, the authors 
deliberately went about to construct a complete nonsense argument about how the penis is a social construct which is responsible for climate change. And guess what, guys? It got peer-reviewed and approved and published in that peer-reviewed journal. So uh, it does get more and more and more blatant and ridiculous. And the point of that particular hoax was to show that as long as journals, uh, as long as papers corresponded to the moral outlook of a uh, journal's editors, it will be most likely approved for publication, and it certainly was in that case. It's about constructing a worldview, conforming to the worldview, conforming to the paradigmatic consensus, if we want to get Kuhnian about this. But anyway, um, but this is so blatant by this point, it's undeniable. And I think it's perhaps most clearly manifested in something that I think everyone understands by now, the entire industry of food safety studies of various sorts. And a perfect example of that came out just in the past month where it was discovered, revealed, oh my god, who would have thought it? People who consume artificial sweeteners like aspartame are three times more likely to suffer from a, a common form of stroke than others. Um, who would have thought it except everyone who's been warming, warning about aspartame for decades and decades, and if you want to know more about aspartame and how it got approved in the first place, you can go back and listen to my earlier podcast on Meet Donald Rumsfeld, where we talked about his role in getting aspartame approved for human consumption in the first place. But yes, now decades later, they come out with a study that shows, well, guys, we had no idea, but guess what? It does apparently cause strokes. And this is particularly galling, I suppose, because if you go back even a couple of years ago, the paper of record, the old gray lady, the New York Times, and every other publication, to be fair, that, that ever tried to address this, would always talk about sweeteners as being better than sugar for you, better for you. And they would point to a handful of studies, the same studies every time, including, I mean, just as one example, this 2007 study, the, the, it was a it was a peer review uh, uh, um, a study through various different uh, uh, studies that had been published. And uh, this was done by a panel of experts, as it was said at the time, and it was cited in all of these different uh, reports by the New York Times and others as showing that aspartame was even safer than sugar and blah, blah, blah. And when you actually looked at the study itself, you found that Lo and behold, it was the panel of experts was put together by something called the Burdock Group, which was a consulting firm that worked for the food industry, amongst others, and was in that particular instance hired by Ajinomoto, who people might know as a producer of aspartame. So yes, you have the aspartame manufacturers hiring consultants to put together panels of scientific scientific experts that then come out with the conclusion that yes, aspartame is is sweet as sweet as honey, but good good for you, like breathing breathing oxygen. It's just so wonderful. Oh, it's like manna from heaven. And lo and behold, they were lying. Um, who would have thought it? Who would have imagined that the scientific process could be so thoroughly corrupted? Well, this is the point at which we fi find ourselves now in 2017, where the idea of political and economic influence over the scientific process is undeniable. But I think there's some important lessons to take away from this. And one of them is that this march for science that we saw recently is precisely part of the problem. All of these people who are acting as if the uh, political influence over science and the direction of scientific research is only now a problem, and only because there is a Republican in the uh, in the White House, are themselves perpetuating the problem. Because these are the same people who had no problem, or if they did have a problem, certainly weren't out marching in the streets about it when Obama appointed uh, industry insiders to uh, to head up the FDA and other departments like that. Again, nothing could possibly go wrong under a Democrat administration, but now that it's a Republican. No, this is the weaponization of the idea of science as a political tool to use against enemies. So that when you have a political enemy, all you have to do is call them anti-scientific, and you win the argument by default, apparently. Now, this, of course, has nothing to do with 
science properly defined, which is the scientific method, which is a method for coming to an empirical understanding about the empirical facts of the universe, the laws of the universe and how, how reality functions. It is a process, a method for discovering that. But people take that scientific method and they talk, they smear it out and they, they talk about science as if it's some, some thing which you can be or not be. And if you are not being that thing, then you are the enemy, you are the political other, you are anti-scientific. Uh, and it is, it is being weaponized. And this is part of the scientism, which is uh, very much different from a, 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 a belief in the scientific method as a method for discovering the laws of the universe. Scientism is the reification of science, which ultimately leads to this politicization of the term science. Now, this is an important concept, but uh, it's one that requires a bit of elaboration. So I will throw in some links, not only to the aspartame debacle that I talked about uh, just a few minutes ago, but also to uh, some articles that I've written on this, talking about the crisis of science, which really is a crisis. And it really does go back to the fundamental issue of who's providing the money and that is generally a function of who is in charge of the political purse strings, because that's where a lot of the money comes from, but not always. Sometimes it comes from industry. At any rate, science can certainly be used as a weapon and can certainly be steered in one direction or another based on who is funding any particular research. So that is an important thing to keep in mind and uh, something that I will ask people to reflect on when they see the largest the largest oil companies in the world, Exxon and others, lining up to get on board with the Paris Climate Change Agreement. This is a great thing, guys. We need this. Or when we see governments pumping tens of billions of dollars into research, into anything that so much as claims to be about climate change. The penis as a social construct which contributes to climate change? Yes. We want that kind of research, guys. That's where we want society to head. So let's, let's think about that bigger picture and what kinds of science might be being produced as a result of that fundamental skewing of our understanding of reality and the biases of the editors that go on to safeguard the uh, peer-reviewed journals. And as one final note, I'll leave a conversation in the show notes uh, to uh, a link to a conversation that I had with Judith Curry, Dr. Judith Curry, uh, about the idea of peer review and how that can be changing in the internet era. I think that's going to be one of the most important subjects uh, coming from this point forward as people start to look for alternatives around this heavily politicized and biased system. Anyway, that's your thought for the day today. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com.